it's the hero show welcome to the hero show everybody starring the irrepressible andrew bernstein and the redemptive robert begley i am andrew bernstein and you are indubitably robert begley how you doing today robert i'm doing great andy sometimes on this show we talk about watershed moments in world history and today where that subject is a man whose life and death impacted two most important philosophers in history plato and aristotle but it, today it's none other than socrates socrates. <laughs> socrates the man who is white who is widely and i think legitimately credited as the philosopher who gave birth, you know, the thinker who gave birth to the field of moral philosophy as a yes. rational discipline. And I think that's, that's legitimate right. and, and it's an enormous accomplishment. One of the greatest gifts, you know, that uh, any human being can give to his, to his brothers and sisters uh, to take uh, the field of ethics and value questions about good and evil, right and wrong, out of mythology and faith-based beliefs and out of emotionalism and into the province of rational discourse. And I think Socrates preeminently is responsible for that. And he is a towering hero in the field of philosophy. And it's amazing, Andy, because a lot is not known about him, particularly because he was opposed to writing anything down. He, he was a verbal, philosopher, a verbal teacher, and even being a teacher, he rejected that title. But in any subject, any discipline you pursue, the first proper question to ask is, how do you know? And that's a big part of the Socratic method, because if you can't answer by reason, as you just mentioned, Dandy, if you can't answer by reason, then why should we continue the discussion? That's the, the human faculty is reason. And that's Socrates there. Yeah, yeah. And and by the, so by the way, everybody, so Socrates dates from 469 to 399 BC. So he's fifth century. Yes. Uh, he's, he's fifth century BC. This bust is a... a, a, a is a flattering likeness. People who knew him always remarked that he was extraordinarily ugly. <laughs> yes. <You know? laughs> uh, but this bust is 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 not. But you know, it's it's an interesting point. You know, we would everybody uh, we were discussing yesterday on the on the, in the Fountainhead course we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, Dominique Franken sees Howard Rock at first sight. She falls in love with him. His face, the most beautiful face she'd ever seen. It's strength. The vision of strength personified meaning moral strength and the question you know yes. can you recognize moral beauty and moral greatness in somebody's face and, and i think the answer to that is sometimes you can and sometimes you can't socrates was not outwardly beautiful but but inwardly he was and maybe you could because sometimes even despite the bone structure of the face of it sometimes good or evil will shine forth out of somebody's eyes you, just, you can see it in, in somebody's eyes you know, and I'm, I'm guessing here that people could see the light of, you know, of moral goodness in Socrates' eyes, despite the, the facial f physiognomy may have been uh, exceedingly unattractive. But, but anyway, yeah, the, 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 pu the pug nose. Yeah, yeah, the, pu the yeah. pug nose is one of the distinctions that whenever there's a description of him, which we do have, we do have some descriptions of him, but again, keeping in the context of an era where he refused to write anything. So everything we're getting are secondhand accounts. And that's also a big part of knowledge. What, you know, what can you believe and what can you not believe? What can you prove and not prove? And uh, if we just go from his, you know, a little bit of the timeline of his biography, <clears throat> grew up, uh, the son of a, of a uh, stone cutter. A stone mason. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And not wealthy, not, not wealthy, but uh, early in life, one of the pivotal moments of his life is he fought in a war and demonstrated courage immediately, saved the mm -hmm. life of Al uh, Alcibiades, who would go on to be incredible, uh, an, an incredible figure in Athens. Uh, by the way, his entire life lived in Athens. The only time he left it was to, to go fight the war. He absolutely right. loved sure. Athens. And 
just one example of his bravery in the snow uh, on the ice. He walked barefoot. You know, we, t- we right. talk about his physical appearances. You could always tell Socrates because he wore just shortly more than rags with never had shoes. And so clearly physical appearance was not a, a, a big part of who he was, but he, he rescued Alcibiades and the, the witnesses who saw this were completely impressed with, uh, with Socrates' courage. Yeah, walking around in rags and barefoot and, ev- and everything, not caring about physical appearance. And clearly he's not Cary Grant. You know, uh, to, to to make a Hollywood <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> no. reference, but but um, yeah, the um, he tells us yes. Yeah, so, uh, anyway, so he's a war hero. This is uh, the Peloponnesian War uh, yes. against Sparta. Uh, he's born four sixty nine. Some some accounts say four seventy BC. So he he's born right right after the heyday of Athenian triumph. You know they they've just defeated the mighty Persian Empire to to maintain. Mm-hmm. I think the Battle of Salamis was was it four eighty BC. I think so. It says ten ten. You know the the naval right. battle in which the Athenian navy mm-hmm. sank the invading Persian fleet. It's just like. 10 or 11 years before Socrates' death. So he's born in the afterglow of, you know, their great triumph over the Persians. But the ill-starred, ill-fated war against Sparta, uh, which was bungled by the Athenians, they, they had all the advantages. They certainly could have, you know, could have won that, that war. Not mm-hmm. all the advantages, but they had many uh, advantages of wealth and, na- and naval power and, you know, and, and, and so on, a population, and, 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 and actually had a literate, educated population. But be that as it may, uh, the war was terribly bungled, including you mentioned by, you know, Alcibiades. And um, uh, uh, Socrates, great war hero, without a doubt. And uh, did, you want to, did you want to discuss anything else about his war? Is it, he's, is, is, is several people who, you know, were familiar with him accounted, you know, gave us like the accounts of his bravery in battle, his mental and physical toughness to stand up against yes. the, the weather, like you said, lack of food, you know, and everything. Uh, it's just, he was, he was a definite, definite war hero, without, without a doubt. Yeah, and hard shift. And as you said, Andy, moral character, the, these are strengths that when the opponents saw him they you know they pulled back they were you know they they were impressed that this man had that much courage and um but yeah there, there's much, a lot more to go we, 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 we and be, yeah. before we even leave the army and get to his mm-hmm. you know his illustrious career as a philosopher we should point out he was much older than soldiers generally uh you, you know soldiers generally you know prime of their young manhood, late teens and 20s. I, I remember correctly, Socrates was in his 40s, wasn't he, when he was- uh, Yeah, I think so. When he was serving mm-hmm. in, in the Peloponnesian War? He was cert- certainly past the, the, the physical prime of great athletes, you know, you know, great, you know, young, you know y- young, powerful physical specimens. But his will, he wills himself to stand, you know, in, in yeah. battle against the, you know, the, the, on rushing armies, uh, he wills himself to, to withstand the hardships of the of the cold weather and lack of food and everything. It's his extraordinary willpower here that I think is so uh, is so mm-hmm. noteworthy. Yeah, but he's yeah, not so, remembered prim- primarily no, as he's war not hero, but as a moral how- philosopher. Is it, is it? <laughs> right, <laughs> and so much of what we know about him comes from two famous contemporaries, uh, students of his, Plato, uh, who was his student, and Aristophanes covers him in the play, The Clouds. And, <laughs> it's very, um, funny. It's very funny. Who not, kind of pokes, not, pokes, not, not accurate at all, but it's very funny. Yes. Aristophanes yeah, but, is a, a very talented comedic writer. Right. And, but also the, the, the point about Socrates is this idea of how do we know what he said? So now we can talk about the, the Plato question because you cannot separate Socrates from Plato. And uh, as, as a student, Plato did know the importance of writing. And here was one disagreement between the two because <laughs> Socrates' point was, no, you should not write down what I'm saying because guess what? over time your views will change and you will put my words in your 
in your mouth. And that's precisely what happened. And scholars debate about this, the, the distinction between the two. And I have a bunch of books here. Carrie Ann, yeah, um, who's knows. an ancient scholar, she's, she's studied this. And there's a play that I'm going to talk about, which also addresses it. But what we, what we do think is early Socrates accurately, uh, some of early uh, dialogues, his early dialogues accurately captures Socrates. And then as Plato aged, he had more of his own, <clears throat> his own ideas uh, put yeah, into Socrates' best, mouth. You know, certainly the, one of the leading historians of philosophy, W.T. Jones, in his you know massive five volumes, a history of Western philosophy yes. that I have enormous respect for. That's Jones, uh, you know, puts forth that view. I think that's widely accepted among scholars, but but the deeper truth is nobody knows, uh, and 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 scholars get around the problem by referring to it as the Socratic Platonic philosophy. But which parts yes. were originated by Socrates and adopted by Plato, and then which parts were originated by Plato and then put into the mouth of Socrates as his foremost spokesman in his dialogues? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. With, with with any certainty, but it makes sense that the the early, the early Platonic dialogues under Socratic influence was was a lot of Socrates, and the later Platonic dialogues after Socrates was long gone, and after Plato had engaged in many discussions on philosophy with Aristotle at the Academy, that the mm -hmm. later Platonic dialogues were most likely mature Plato's own own thinking. Uh, that, that that's yeah. as good a theory as any, and probably the best, and probably the best we're going to do. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to me as a uh, not an expert in ancient mm -hmm. philosophy, but you know I know a little bit about <clears> it. Uh, it. Makes sense to me. Uh, but anyhow, yeah. Uh, wh whoever originated these ideas, we we know how enormously influential you know that that they have been. Uh, Socrates, of course, I got got to mention the, the, at least one immortal line from Socrates. You know, the unexamined life is not worth living. We got to get that out there, you know? Yes. The unexamined yes. life is not worth living. So, wow, what a, you know, that that's that's a piece of, that. there's an aphorism that's a piece of intellectual dynamite, you know? Mm -hmm. What is that? I mean, what does that mean? I always, you know, I th I'm not the only philosophy professor, I'm sure, who raises this in class constantly. <laughs> I'm sure your philosophy professors have done this for thousands of years. They'll probably continue to do it for thousands of years. You know, get their students thinking about that. What, what does that mean to say the unexamined life is not worth living? And, you know, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a line that's brilliantly insightful, you know, and just, just pregnant with meaning. So mm -hmm. what does it mean? We should we, we should we should sure. we should discuss it right now. Was it? What is, I know you're you're a very thoughtful guy. What do you what do you take it, from, Robert? <laughs> well, first of all, it's it's telling me in introspectively examine your life and what are you doing in your life. And if we talk about the moral, the birth of moral philosophy, what is good and what is not good for your life, and. Uh, by examining it, things you know, motivations, things that uh, uh, that cause you to take different actions in different circumstances. How do you build your character? We talked about Socrates' moral character in battle, and uh, so these kinds of questions are how we examine uh, our lives, and <laughs> they should make it worth living. You know, for, for yeah. me, I'm all for life, my, you know, particularly my life and my own happiness. So I do want to examine what are the requirements of that? Those right. are what comes to my mind there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, no that, that makes sense. Uh, and also, you know, I, I'll point out to, to students, you know, animals can't reflect upon the meaning of their life. They, they, they live it as best they can. If you have a dog or a yes. cat or whatever, you know, or any animal, they don't, so, don't have the brain power to raise the question, what does it all mean? But human animals, we have we have that kind of brain power. What separates us, and big part of what makes us human, is to be reflective. You know, and to think about what does this all add up to? What does it all mean? And what, what's good in in our in in my life, and what's bad? What's right? What's wrong? And Socrates, all through the Platonic dialogues, you know, those those especially those early dialogues in the Crito and the Phaedo and the Apology. Mm -hmm. You know, you see Socrates emphasizing over and over again the importance of 
knowing what's right and then you know doing doing what's right it's more important to be virtuous than it is to be beautiful or wealthy or admired and everything is most important thing is to be morally upright socrates emphasizes this you can't you can't be morally upright if you're not reflective if you're not examining mm-hmm. the, the 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 events of your life the people in it my own choices uh the choices of the people uh, that I'm familiar with, and the choices of the government of of the country, we we can't we can't examine uh, we we can't know what's good, what's right, and wrong, unless we're enormously reflective and you know examining the uh, events of our uh, of our life on and do it on on a regular basis. And I think mm-hmm. that examine life is not worth living. I think I think a part what Socrates is telling us is you're living an animal's life, not a human life, if you're not yeah. you know critically reflecting upon the events of your life and the choices you make and the moral status of those choices so he really mm-hmm. he's really a hero just for that alone his emphasis on moral rectitude his recognition that this is by far the most important thing in human life you know we we're all caught up in the fountain that we're doing that course now but howard rock and socrates could sit down and discuss this they might disagree on what moral rectitude you know how what, what constitutes moral rectitude but on its importance and on on that, this is the preeminent uh, uh, characteristic for human beings to cultivate. I think you know Ayn Rand and her heroes are, uh, you know, would would absolutely agree with Socrates about this. Great point, Andy. So, how about we set the philosophic context of Socrates in who are called the pre-Socratics? I mean, that's how pivotal he was in in the history of philosophy. There wasn't right. that that's much right. prior to him, but you had the sophists, you had skeptics. And um, they, you know, they had their own views. And one of the things that, and they're covered in Plato's uh, works in in his dialogues. Some of the different, um, some of the different philosophers, but they had little bits and fragments. They 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 were not that influential, you know, until as we said, Socrates came along and started asking these pointed, specific questions on how you know, and one moment- Wait, wait, hold hold, hold on a second. Uh, Yeah. All that that are are extant are fragments, but the, you know, the the earlier, the pre-Socratics may well have written, you know, uh, more more extensive pieces. All that we have are fragments. Yes, you're right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most, most of what we know about the history of ancient philosophy we know from aristotle you know who right. uh fortunately starts off any question with well what did our predecessors say on this and then he goes through well yes. you know Thales said this and anaximander said that and yes. Pythagoras said that you know we have we have uh a good good deal of knowledge from him uh but but anyhow yeah so we don't we don't know you know Thales said you know all things are water and uh, from, that's all that all that remains from longer works that a, a lot of these philosophers uh, had had composed. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so, so the fragments are all that's extant. But it, but anyhow, but but yeah, uh, so- Socrates, you, you're right. It's a good point. Pre-Socratics really really emphasizes the importance of Socrates. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a whole several centuries of of philosophizing before Socrates mm-hmm. grouped together, well, they're, they're pre-Socratics. That's how important, you know, Socrates yeah. is such a benchmark here in, yeah. in the history of, of philosophy. And a lot of important things we should, we should mention. I mean, I have an essay coming out in, in the objective standard, heroes and, and villains in, in Western philosophy. And I point out the first hero of philosophy is Thales, uh, because you know, mm-hmm. who's generally considered the father of philosophy because he's the one who moved from mythology to empirical data as you know what what's the world composed of what's made out of water which is erroneous but Thales observing he know he, he observes that water you know at certain temperatures water is liquid at, at, at other temperatures it freezes and it's solid at, at, at higher temperatures it boils and it's it's gas it's steam you know and, and all living things require water so he's making a, a very educated guess that's mistaken ultimately but a very educated guess based on observation not on mythological you know beings that nobody's ever encountered you know they're supposed to be a zeus and athena but nobody's ever encountered them you know so mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the a lot of this material 
from the pre-Socratics is important. I, and I think I, in my essay, I really pointed out uh, that Thales is the first hero of philosophy. Nevertheless, you're right. We have very little uh, from them. And, and they weren't in a time period when somebody was taking down their thoughts. Was Socrates, he hasn't written anything, but as you pointed out, Plato, uh, in Socrates' later years, the young Plato is his student. And Plato imbibes from Socrates a great deal of wisdom and writes, and writes it down, creating, or the two of them, they're, they're by in harmony, creating the Socratic Platonic philosophy, which we have in a, in a voluminous writings of, of Plato. But anyhow, that's a yeah. long-winded way of saying it. there's a lot of, a lot of important things um, in, in Greek philosophy prior to Socrates, but you were absolutely right, pointed out that just, just the terminology of calling them the pre-Socratics emphasizes, underscores Socrates' importance, what a benchmark he is in the history of philosophy. So I, I'm sorry, I, I yeah. interrupted you. No, that's, that's, you perfectly stated, Andy, and it's just like if we look in, in history. By the way, America, by the way, do we have, have, the pre have an image? Uh, do we have an image of the cover of the, of that uh, objective standard? It would, it yeah, would, Elliot, if you can share that. Yeah, there. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, heroes and villains in philosophy. Unfortunately, Socrates didn't make the cover. You know, we have... Aristotle, but the and two who, who who he influenced the most are right yeah. square we have, we have center John from Locke the school of Ayn Athens. Rand. Right, mm -hmm. that's from the school of Athens. We have John Locke and Ayn Rand, some of the heroes of philosophy on Aristotle's side. We have Kant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kicking all the you barely see Kant's face, which is appropriate. Uh, which have <laughs> Kant and Marx, Kant and Marx, two of the villains of philosophy on 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 Plato's side, and uh, uh, but but yeah, so Socrates unfortunately didn't make the cover, but he gets a lot of he gets a lot of discussion in the in the essay. So uh, that's yeah. the this this issue is coming out like this week, isn't it? This it's out online. Uh, just sent out the okay. announcement, so you can get it there, and the physical copy yeah should be out uh, within a week or so. So we look forward to that and anything, Andy, you want to talk about in today's episode, feel free to, to bring up oh, because you. again, Socrates, if we go that dividing line, the pre-Socratics were not as not that influential, but Socrates was a divine line towards Western civilization, birth of moral philosophy. And what we know is epistemology, the idea of how do we know where he's using reason specifically as his means of knowledge, which we know Aristotle followed him down that path. The interesting thing is Aristotle gets some things, uh, some similarities with Socrates and Plato has different similarities with Socrates. But if, if we just go through the timeline of uh, Socrates' life, some pivotal moments, uh, one of them is when a friend of his comes from Delphi and he's asking the oracle in Delphi, who is, who is the wisest person in, in the wisest man in Athens? And the answer is Socrates. So he rushes to Socrates' home and tells him, you know, I asked the oracle, you're, you're the wisest man. And what's Socrates' reaction? Is he happy? No. <laughs> he's like, no, I'm not. And I'll prove it. And how will I prove it? I'll go to everyone and start asking them questions to see how wise they are. And of course, it backfires. It backfires in many ways because now he starts to become an agitator. And some of the charges that eventually lead to his death, uh, that's like one of the pivotal moments. And you want to just uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah. There's Socrates, um, I think much as I admire Socrates, I think he's a, he's a little bit disingenuous in claiming, oh, I'm, I'm ignorant. He, he, he says, you know, uh, well, obviously he knows a great deal, um, but it's also a, maybe disingenuous or, or dishonest is too strong a word. It's also a teaching device that, you know, he uses the Socratic method, you know, that he uh, yes. developed. But, he, what, a couple of, but a couple of real positives here. First of all, you know, he points out that recognizing my own ignorance is the first step towards wisdom you know it's it's hard to gain knowledge in different fields philosophy perhaps a, a, above all we all start in ignorance and it's 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 not it's not humility it's certainly not any false modesty to acknowledge that you know that that i'm ignorant 
you like I said before, I'm I'm not I'm no expert in Greek philosophy, you know, in in ancient in ancient philosophy. I know a little bit about it, but you know, I'm not I'm mm-hmm. certainly no expert. You know, and then, you know to to what be able to identify who was it? Was it Socrates or Confucius? Some wise man who said that wisdom wisdom lies in knowing that I know what I know, and in knowing that I do not know what I do not. Know. Yes. <clears throat> you know, you know, that's, I'm not even sure who said that, but it sounds one like of them, but they're, they're yeah. completely yeah. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's absolutely, it's absolutely true. Let me repeat it because uh, in case people didn't get it the first time, wisdom lies in knowing that I know what I know and in knowing that I don't know what I don't know. So now, now in our day, you can find whole encyclopedias and people have on what I don't know. Like for me, I don't know math and I don't know physics. I don't know chemistry. I don't know medicine. I don't know computer science. I don't know auto mechanics. I saw a bunch of things that I don't know. I do know literature and I know philosophy and I know uh, uh, so, something about history. Uh, you know, a, a little bit of economics. That's, that's, that's about it. And, and it's, and the science he's emphasized. Oh yeah, I do know. I do know baseball. Yeah, that's right. That's the most important thing. That's right. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, you know, so to acknowledge our ignorance is a first step towards towards gaining towards gaining wisdom. In contrast to the blowhard types, you know, uh, who we've all known some people like that. You know, they're, they're, or they're sometimes referred to as know it alls or they're windbags and they 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 always have to be right. You know, they can't ever acknowledge that they're wrong or they're ignorant or they don't know. Uh, Socrates, you know, very good, you know, at, at puncturing, at puncturing that. That lays the foundation. It lays the baseline. Now we can explore the subject and you know, and 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 seek to gain wisdom. And then related to that, there are people who claim to have knowledge that in reality they don't know. And Socrates' method of questioning them, including Athenian political leaders. You know, regarding their prosecution of the Peloponnesian War, you know, and you know, and and and, and things like that. You know, Socrates' uh, questioning often shows that these these other people's claim to knowledge are vacuous; that they don't know what they claim to know. Uh, <laughs> they certainly shouldn't be policy makers. <laughs> you know, we should apply this to yeah. a certain somebody who was uh, president of the United States and see what he actually <laughs> see what he <laughs> actually knows, but. Uh, you know, Socrates is Socrates is the Socratic method, the question and answer, the question and answer yeah. method. One designed at times to uh, expose pretentious pretentiousness, the pretentiousness of claims to knowledge and, and, and profound knowledge on the part of people who are uh, who are actually ignorant. And then two, yeah. you know, more benign to try and draw draw people out into a, into a discussion, you know, and, 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 and show that, well, maybe they, maybe they do know something on this. Maybe they do have something to say. Yeah, he's feeding them. He's often feeding them knowledge in the questions that might trigger or catalyze mm-hmm. thinking on, the, on their part and draw them into, uh, into a fascinating philosophic discussion. He's very adroit at, at this. And, yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers use this as their, as their you know, preferred method of teaching, you know, the mm-hmm. question and answer method, and you know, and, and get get student involvement. Um, I just want yeah. to say one other thing uh, about yeah. about this, but, but Aristotle. Uh, before I forget, Aristotle, perhaps the greatest ach- intellectual achievement in all of history, perhaps, f- you know, d- the d- developing the field of logic, you know, I- identifying the. The, the rules of proper, you know, formulating the rules of proper reasoning, identifying the major errors of reasoning, the fallacies. Mm-hmm. Aristotle carves out the field of logic, you know, virtually from scratch. And if I remember correctly from, read, from reading Aristotle's logic, you know, years ago, the one person he credits was Socrates because Socrates identified- Definitions? Crucial, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The crucial importance of definitions to literally yeah. know what we're talking about. And this is a big part of logical discourse. Define your terms. Definitions mm-hmm. are our friends, I like to tell my students. <laughs> Definitions yeah. are our friends. Define key terms. You know, Ayn Rand does this brilliantly. Like, she defines capitalism. She defines, you know, she defines a lot of these, these political economic terms that are often woozy, 
You know, you know, mm-hmm. you know I, I, yeah, politics is a good example of that because, you know, you'll hear the politicians say, this great democracy of ours and everything. And it's like, like, what definition of democracy are, are you deploying? Because thank God the American founders realized that democracy is, uh, you know, the rule, unlimited rule of the majority. It's a type of dictatorship. Remember Ben Franklin's uh, and the, and the and the founders knew that Socrates. You know, we'll get to this. We'll talk more about democracy. But they knew Socrates. His death was exactly what demo- what democracy ended up. That's the application of democracy. Right. I'll just talk about yeah, that. We'll. I think. Yeah. You know, towards the end, we'll yeah, elaborate a little bit more on that. But you're absolutely right. Do you remember Benjamin Franklin's? humorous uh, perspective on democracy and I, I always tell my students this because it's perfect franklin said yeah. democracy is like two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for lunch so so go ahead yeah. lamby yeah. you get a vote what's for lunch <laughs> oh well, well grass yes right? it's grass for lunch. <laughs> yeah. all right the wolves get a photo well what's for lunch well we vote for lamb you know, like, yeah. well, you've all, you outvoted, Lammy. You know, you're yes. lunch. Franklin's <laughs> absolutely right. This is democracy in, in action. It's yep. unlimited majority rule. Mm-hmm. And you're right. That's exa- you're right that that's what was done to Socrates, and the American founders knew that's what was done yeah. to Socrates. But anyway, yeah. Socrates so- emphasizes the importance of definitions. And notice, notice Plato's dialogues, the Republic, the question: What is justice? The Symposium: What is love? You know the mm-hmm. theatetus. What is knowledge? The, uh, you know the, uh, the the Protagoras. What is virtue? The Euthyphro. What is piety? You know he's he's always seeking definitions for these key moral philosophical terms, and thereby you know adva- adva- make sure we're on the same page. We know what we're talking about. And we, 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 yeah. we one thing before we sign off later, Robert. We we have to we have to contrast Socrates with the Sophists on this because that's a, that's sure. critically important. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So Socrates. one of my references was uh, Paul Johnson's book, the great historian. It's um, mm-hmm. called Socrates: A Man for Our Times, and he actually mentions the irony. He gives a lot of weight to Socrates' use of irony, um, which really affected him because you as you were saying earlier that that he questioned these people acting dumb like he doesn't know and irony can be dangerous you know if people don't know you're joking they i'd rather i'm not a fan of irony i'd rather know clarity is much more important to me i want to know if someone disagrees or doesn't disagree but socrates i was kind of built into his style and in, 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 and I, once you brought that point up where he's kind of feigning ignorance, <clears throat> um, my thought, you know, I went to the, to Paul Johnson's idea that uh, he, irony held a lot of weight. And there, there are a couple of, uh, you know, scholarly essays on, on that topic as well. So just wanted to add that. <clears throat> right, right. Um, and we the critical... You know, we we can get all caught up in the discussion of various aspects and then and then forget to do the most important thing. So let's make sure we yeah. we do that. You know the, the Socrates in relation to the Sophists, because sure. you, you know the 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 Sophists were a, a band of traveling educators. Pythagoras is the most famous, the foremost. Yeah, Pasimachus, well known uh, in from from Plato's Republic as one of the younger, more radical sophists. Might uh, makes right and, is is Thrasymachus, and man is the measure of all things is Protagoras. For those who don't know yeah. these obscure names, <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good, Rob. Yeah, that's that's very succinct and and accurate. Justice is the will of the stronger. I think Thrasymachus yeah. says in the in the Republic, which you're absolutely right. In in, in everyday parlance, mm-hmm. means might makes right. Um, mm-hmm. But but uh, but the sophists you know, for, uh, were a group of traveling educators, and we get the English word sophisticated from them. You know, meaning worldly yes. wise, and you know, not yep. not ignorant, and, and have knowledge of how knowledge of how the world works. And and to the sophists, sophistication. You know, in the fifth century BC, sophistication meant uh, recognition that there are no gods. That's mythology. And consequently, there's no objective right and wrong. Uh, there's no there's no objective right and wrong in in science or in ethics in in, in any field. Yeah. When when you, you're you're right, you're right, Robert. Protagoras said, "Man is the measure of all things," meaning 
each human being and for himself. Uh, truth is relative. And now, now right. Protagoras was a social conservative uh, who thought it was best to go along with society. You know, it was, it was expedient. If you, if, if you go along with society, mm -hmm. you could live, if you're in Athens, you know, you could live, uh, you, you know, a, a good life in a society like Athens, where if you fight it, you're going to, you know, you're going to bring all kinds of trouble on yourself. For Simicus, mm -hmm. so, so in any way, I think one one version of of the of the relativism here is you know what's yes, known mo as so moral relativism is a term, man. They just wanted to get that in there, right? That's the yeah. that's what Socrates opposed is this idea yes. of moral relativism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And 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 one version of it is that you know truth and right are relative socially. That is, it varies from society to society. Mm -hmm. uh, for Simicus, much more radical. Oh, you know, true. You know, the tr the true and the right vary not just from society to society, but even within a society, from person to person, from individual to individual. So he has an even more extreme version of of relativism. But anyway, they they agree that there's no such thing as the truth. Certainly not in ethics, uh, and not in, not in any field, not even in, in in science, but certainly not in ethics. Now. Socrates is the hero who rises up to stand up against this sea of subjectivism and the, and and this sea of relativism, and mm -hmm. uh, so Socrates is the one who who claiming that there's such a thing as the truth in ethics and that it can be discovered by rational analysis, and one of the methods that he deploys to gain that truth is to this rig this search for rigorous definitions. That you know, we, we yeah. if if we know what justice is, if we can, you know, and here, um, let me bring in Aristotle and his and his followers. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the law of identity. You know, A is A. A thing is what it is. Well, not contradiction, right? A thing is not what it is not. So, on 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 that understanding, and I think Socrates doesn't have that understanding. You know, he's he dies 15 years prior to Aristotle's birth. But I think at some implicit level, the way I understand it, some implicit level, he grasps that. The thing is what it is. And it's not what it is not. Which means justice is what it is. It has a nature. You know, uh, honesty is what it is. And it has a, it has a nature. Integrity is what it is. And it has a, it has a nature. Virtue is what it is. It has, a, it has a nature. And then we discover that by rational analysis. And we could define these terms and once we've rigorously defined these terms, we can hold ourselves and others to the, a proper moral standard that we, we act justly. We can act in accordance with justice and we expect the state to act in accordance with, with, uh, with the nature of justice. Wow. I mean, this mm -hmm. is brilliant. I mean, Socrates is really, this is a, a huge advance. He, he's, he's the one yeah. who founds uh, the field of moral philosophy on an objective basis, as opposed to the subjectivism and relativism of the sophists, mm -hmm. and on a rational basis, as opposed to mythology, religion, Christianity doesn't exist yet, but Judaism does, uh, and yeah. on the you know, and contrasted with so contrasted with faith-based beliefs, uh, uh, ra mm -hmm. rational approach to moral philosophy is contrasted with faith-based beliefs, and of course, uh, rational rational as contrasted to emotionalism, that's just going with with our feelings. Which the sophist mm -hmm. basically, you know, said, uh, whether it's society's feelings or an individual's feelings, ethics, uh, right and wrong, is a matter of taste. It's a matter of, you know, of, of people's own prejudices and, and preferences. And Socrates says no, and moral philosophy is born here, and this is enormously important. And this, if for nothing yeah. else, Socrates should be lionized and you know and treated as a hero uh, for this. This is his greatest achievement: the birth mm -hmm. of moral philosophy as an objective, rational discipline. That's huge. Great point, Andy. And now let's show how the term integrity didn't exist back then, but <clears throat> here's how he applies this idea. What is justice? There is a trial. Um, uh, the Greeks have this battle in Sicily and it ends up being a disaster. A lot of four, like 4,000 Greeks are left behind to die. And several of the, um, the generals, the military generals, are called in for trial and for execution, six of them. And they want to execute them all, all in one shot. <clears throat> and Socrates says he's actually one of the jurors at the time. He, he, so he's still younger. He's still held in high esteem. And he says, no, they should each be 
treated and judged uh, individually, not as a, not as a collective. So we see his idea of justice, and we see his idea of individualism, two <laughs> traits that we fortunately still uh, inherited uh, in Western civilization. But here's a here's an example where he stands up for the principle of individualism and applying U.S. What is justice? Well, we need evidence for each one of these people, and the mob says, no, kill them all, basically kill them all at once, which is what they end up doing. And so, yeah, they're like, they're so like, they're acting like sophists. They're acting like sophists, yes. right? They're just going with their feelings. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because they're angry. There are families, the way the trial went, there were the families of the, the 4,000 who were killed and they wanted mm -hmm. vengeance for the ones responsible. Sure. Well, no, it was actually, who was it? The, the Peninsula War, the, the ones who actually killed them, not the generals. They they didn't do that. So again, here's an instance where Socrates is going against. He's standing for the principle of justice and and individualism, and <clears throat> so if we just continue on with his with his life story, because we more and more the authorities are seeing his power, uh, his, the rise of his power, and they want to stop him. They, they are more of the status quo. But by the way, Greece at that time, Athens, it, it was still the, it was the greatest city in the world, but there was a lot of turmoil. There was plague, there was constant wars. Life was not, you know, it, it was not very easy for everybody. And, um, but once the authorities saw the impact of Socrates, who said, wait a minute, I'm not rich. I'm not a politician. I'm not even a teacher. You know, so he's downplaying his inf influence, but they see Plato, they see um, Alcibiades. Okay, let's let's go to him, a great general who was heavily influenced by Socrates, and um, his his popularity goes up and down depending on which which way the battles go. Um, and now the authorities feel like this man is too powerful; we must stop him. Okay, and so this leads us to the to the the trial of socrates and uh which plato covers in four of his books right i think the crito yeah uh, the crito the phaedo the apology Phaedo, it's, and, 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 it, and it's brilliantly done i i mean with the, you know i yes. disagree with plato and fundamentals but the his uh his his the way he covers that is just is and it, who knows if it's historically accurate i mean we don't know we we guess mm -hmm. that it, it, mm -hmm. it is, but it, it's it's brilliant. It's brilliantly done in his his presentation of Socrates, determined to do the right thing, determined to, to yeah. be a man of upright moral integrity, even if it costs him his life. It's a brilliant depiction of uh, commitment to virtue above all, even in the face of yep. death. That's it's it's mm -hmm. brilliantly done by Plato. You know, I disagree with him on fundamentals, but I guess you know, and I'm not I'm not gonna ever advocate for Plato on the Hero Show because I think his 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 harm no. vastly outweighs the good. But he brilliantly yes. portrays the what a, what a man of virtue looks like even in the face of death, and it's it's very inspiring. Yeah, and it's very well done by Plato. Yeah, yeah. So quickly, the they vote for. Socrates, they have these trumped up charges, uh, impiety, corrupting the youth. And, and, impiety, and you, he know, was... you know, you know, Robert, let me just say something here real quick. Yeah. Corrupting the morals of the youth. I always thought was a ridiculous charge because I, because it's very obvious to me that the, the youth doesn't need anybody's help in corrupting their morals, you know? So they're very, they're very, they're very capable of doing that. Of doing that on their own, uh, I say, I say as a, you know, as somebody who, who misspent a great deal of his youth. But um, yeah, the, but the impiety <laughs> judge, I mean, Socrates. Yeah, Socrates is simultaneously an atheist and the most god intoxicated man in history. Right, but uh, but I yeah. but I interrupt you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Robert. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Well, actually, a monotheist. Like I think that was one of the one of the important things is because they prefer the gods they were polytheists you know they they believed in all right. of these uh, mythological gods and in that sense i i think he was closer to a monotheist and not saying that's right and that's certainly not saying that that's a a punishable by death offense so the the voting is narrowly uh, narrowly they pronounce him guilty <clears throat> and then what's the sentence going to be 
and they allow Socrates to defend himself. And he says, well, I really haven't done anything wrong. And I think, frankly, what you should do is treat me like an Olympic winner and feed me for life. Right, right. Um, so let so me comment here. For a little, Knowing for a that would get under their skin, right? That's, is that ironic oh, yeah. or is that uh, yeah, yeah, being oh, serious? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, it's it's true. What he says is true, but you know, we should we should we should point out here that's interesting. Um, if you, no matter no matter how religious you are, and 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 you and I are not, but for somebody else like Socrates, mm -hmm. no matter how religious you are, if you reject the only gods recognized in a given society, then in that society you're you're considered an atheist. And so there's Socrates, you're right. He rejects yes. the Olympian religion of Zeus and Athena and Aphrodite and Apollo and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for some religious view that uh, I'm not, nobody knows exactly. It sounds like he's moving towards monotheism. You are correct. Absolutely. Because he talks about God. Plato often capitalizes it. So, uh, but anyway, he rejects yep. the Olympian religions, the, the, the only gods embraced in Athens. And so from this, from their standpoint, he's, he's an atheist. Uh, but the other point is great. The, the uh, hubris, you know, the hubris, I mean, what he's saying is true. You know, hubris meaning the, the Greek view of, of, of an overbearing pride. He knows this yeah. is going to, you know, uh, is going to anger the court. He, he's been brought up on these charges. They they think they they've charged, they've charged him with being a bad guy, and he gets up and he's been convicted, and he get you know and he gets up when they when they allow the convicted prisoner to suggest punishment. He gets up and says, like you said, Robert, for all the services I provided Athens, you should feed, you should give me room and board for the yo know, for the rest of my life. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's sticking it to them. He said, "Yeah, so much for your charges, you know." And of course, he knows it's gonna it's gonna anger them, and you know, and they, and they 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 disagree. They disagree with Socrates' suggested punishment. No room and board for the rest of your life. So actually, you are gonna get room and board for the rest of your life, Socrates. But the rest of your life is about three days uh, because we yeah, are it's, imposing. It's gonna be very short. Death, yeah, yeah, we are imposing the death sentence on you. So. So the interesting thing there, Andy, is that the the margin of votes in favor of death was more was a lot higher than it was whether he was guilty or not it was a very narrow margin that that they proclaimed him guilty but then the charge of death it was you know he angered so many other people that the charge of death was more and he and, knew and he and he knew that was probably that was a good chance that was yes. going to happen he was willing to roll the dice yeah. because he was throwing yeah. it back in their face to tell them the truth yeah you know, the, for yeah. the service that I have rendered this city, this is how you should repay me with free room and board for the rest of my life. And he's right. And so far as, you know, mm -hmm. that, that kind of socialist, you know, approach. Mm -hmm. he's, he's right that he, he's rendered Athens a great service and, and he's sticking it to them. And he's willing, he's willing to pay, he's willing to pay the price. Well, this, this is a real Willing hero. to pay the ultimate price. Again, his yeah. integrity comes through. Now, what does he do? He has, there are, there are, um, there's a festival that lasts for a couple of weeks. Like normally they just kill him the next day, but because of this festival, they take a pause and they put him in jail. <clears throat> they allow him to have visitors during the daytime. And at night he, he reflects and he thinks, and he does some of his most, according to Plato and, and the others, Crito, his most philosophic thinking on his deathbed. You know, last time we talked about, Grant writing his memoirs while he's dying of cancer. Here's a man knowing he's going to be death killed, and he's just still thinking and coming up with ideas. And every and now there's a plan. Wait a minute, we can get him out of here. We we have yeah. some money. Plato, by the way, was wealthy. Um, I don't know how many people know that, but he was wealthy. Yeah. And Crito, so, even though Socrates never really accepted <laughs> money, he was surrounded by wealthy people and they had a plan to have him escape and he said no I'm, even on the trial they they gave him that option of just admitting just stop doing what you're doing and we'll let you live and he said no i'd rather get killed a hundred times over the, if you're going to shut me up uh, or if you're going to send me away i'm going to be the, doing the same thing in that new place so i'm standing on my principle here and saying that uh i will not change i will i will not um uh, cave in to this to this unprincipled stance that you want me to take, and it affects everybody around him. His family at this time he has 
uh, his wife uh, and a young children. I think he was like 65 when he had his first, his last uh, child. He was still like a strong man, even even though he yes. kind of developed yes. a bit of a belly towards the end of his life. But uh, what about those people around him? They're all wondering for their own interests. Well, we want you. You know, we want you to be to be here. And he says, No, this is not. I'm, I'm going through with taking the taking the hemlock poison. To, uh, right. which we have in this you're, very you're, famous uh, painting here. Go right. ahead, Andy. You're right. You're right, Robert. Um, Plato depicts this in the Crito. You know, Crito, who's a wealthy mm -hmm. businessman, I could arrange for your escape. And and yeah. a, and Socrates says to him, and it gives him a whole bunch of, uh, of reasons. We love you, your family, you know, your wife, your children. Yeah. And, 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 and Socrates says, well, we believe, don't we, in doing right above all, above all? And Crito says yes, and, and Socrates says, "Well, let's identify here what 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 the right is." And he gives this very conservative argument that you know that the state has has weaned me. The state is, and in in and in the Athenian society, there's some credibility. You know, the state has weaned me. It's, it's all these advantages of being an, an Athenian citizen. You know, I benefited from 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 living in Athens. All you know, all of these all of these years and you know in exchange for that what what the society expects of me is to obey the laws that there's there's laws here there's a certain due process to use modern terminology there's there's a court system there's trials and we expect you know that the honest citizens will abide by the by the law and by the dictates of the you know the the judgments of of the court uh it's not socrates says well if i think the judgment of the court is mistaken therefore you know, I can, I can, vi I can go against it. I can transgress its verdict, and you know, and or transgress the laws. You know, what's going to happen to society if you know if everybody you know, could take it upon themselves to think, well, this is an unjust law. I'm going to break it. This is this is a this yeah. is a, a dishonest verdict. I'm going to I'm going to ignore it and, and you know, transgress it and so forth. It gives this very conservative argument. Uh, about the necessity to you know the to obey the laws that the the laws of the land you know are, are sacred. Otherwise, is, there'll be no civilized society, which has a certain amount of of truth to it. And I think you know, I've taught this many times in class, and you know, discussed it many times with students. And I think you know, prior to the origination of the principle of individual rights, which comes only you know, hundreds two thousand years. years later. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, almost two thousand. Right, two, yeah, yeah, it is two thousand years. You're right because it's you know mm -hmm. Locke and 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 the British in the seventeenth century. That is, that is two thousand years later. Um, and um, prior prior to the, the development of any principle of uh, of individual rights and inalienable individual rights, Socrates's argument you know makes sense. As Athens is basically a civilized society. Uh, it's flawed. But you know, it's a, it's a preeminently an advanced society. There's a lot of benefits here, and the the there's like a social compact here that we we sign with the state to to obey its laws, and then we get all the advantages of of living in Athens. So in that context, your Socrates' argument you know makes a makes a certain amount of sense. But you know, I, obviously, I disagree with it. But the the thing that's always impressive to me is the commitment to doing what I think is right. Even if I think he's wrong about what he thinks is right, <laughs> but the commitment yes. to doing yeah. what is right, uh, even if it costs my life, I mean the the heroic stance here that on behalf of moral rectitude, uh, even if it's mm -hmm. in, even if it's mistakenly construed, the heroic stance on behalf of of moral uprightness is very very inspiring and very impressive. And nobody's ever written any. Yeah. Maybe Ayn Rand, <laughs> but other than uh, leave leave Ayn Rand aside because she's sui generis. Uh, perhaps nobody has 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 ever written this inspiring has developed this inspiring picture of doing what's right, even in the face of death, but standing up for for, for what's right. Uh, no, nobody prior to Ayn Rand, I think, has has depicted this as forcefully uh, as as Plato does in in mm -hmm. these uh, in these dialogues on on Socrates' trial and, and Socrates' death. I strongly recommend every yeah. you know every person to 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 read the Crito, the Phaedo, the Apology, uh especially the Crito where, where Socrates is, you know, is is facing death and explaining to his students why it'd be morally wrong for him to escape. 
Now, I think it'd be morally right for him to yeah. escape. I think the Athenian court is very unjust here, but that's a whole nother matter. Yes. He thinks this is morally yeah. right, and he stands by it, he lives by it, he dies for it. It's enormously uh, inspiring and impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, I'll just, uh, a little side note, back in New York, 2019, there was a play by Tim Blake Nelson, who is a famous actor uh, in, in several several movies. Uh, oh, brother, where art thou? He was one of the one of the escape uh, oh, escapees okay, with right. George, Clooney. George Clooney. Anyway, he's George a playwright, Clooney. and he wrote this play. He studied the ancients, and he wrote this play called Socrates. And the interesting, the fascinating thing about this, Andy, I went four times. Carrie Ann and I went four times off Broadway on uh, at the Public Theater, and the central characters are Plato, Socrates is the main character, and there's a 15 year old boy who is interested in studying with Plato, who happens he's never named Aristotle, but it's actually Aristotle. And there's a time gap between the two. So there's flashbacks of all of Socrates' life. And, and the boy Aristotle does not like Athens. He calls it murderous because they murdered their greatest thinker. And the story is so dramatically told. I wrote about it in, mm -hmm. in um, the objective standard and even the writing of it, I have to say was, was a thrill because Carrie Ann and I saw it like in April and I knew the closing night was June 2nd. And usually in New York, the playwrights are there for the final show and there's like a longer bow. And when John, when I wrote the draft for John, I said, look, this has to be published by the end of May because I want to go there because I think the playwright's going to be there and I want to give him a copy of the, of right, right, the right, review right. of the, <laughs> and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And I go there, I send, it's published May 30th and, and I send a link to it to the public theater. And then I bring a copy, print out and bring a copy to the theater and we see the playwright and it turns out we're sitting a few a few seats away and Carrie Ann and I are chatting and we ask him is this going to be made into a movie because I'd love to see it and Andy he goes to me are you Begley and I'm like <laughs> he goes I, I, you're I, famous you're famous now. I, I read your review that was a real good review and I was like wow <laughs> okay cool and we just got on great uh but this work Show Socrates' life, like I said, it's it's so dramatic. But it includes you know, if they if they do life. make it into a movie, I hope they don't. I hope they don't Hollywoodize it, and, you know, and, and change and change mm -hmm. the story. You know, no, no. I think what I think what they would do is just have a have a film version of the play. You know, so like just oh, have a performance great. kind of. Are they are they going to do that? The, are they going to do it? That's what so. he said back it. then. That, oh, that's okay, that's actually great. what he said. But the but. The, what we loved about it was the fact that it showed not only Socrates' impact on Plato, but also on Aristotle. And you saw the similarities between Aristotle, the idea of definitions, the idea of kind of rejecting this next world and the forms, all of the things that, that Socrates did not, uh, did not uh, accept. But even they argue, Plato and Socrates argue about the idea of writing and the fact that Socrates says, are you writing my words? You're going to change them. Over time, they will be changed and, and you won't, people won't know the difference between us. And, and Plato promises that he won't do that. And sure enough, he does it. But he says he taught us not what to think, but how to think, which, you know, mm -hmm. if we look at today's era, <laughs> all we're told is how, you know, how not, we're told what to think. You know what is right, and and instead, the, the one another legacy of Socrates is teaching us how to think. The importance of coming up with your own, you know, thinking for yourself and coming up with your own conclusions based on reason. So, right, uh, yeah, I, that was the best no, dra I, I, dramatic story of Socrates' life that I'd ever seen. What, what was the title, Robert? Good, Socrates. What was the title of the play. That was it. Oh, it's, just, yeah, that was just, great. I wish I, I wish I'd seen just, it. I hope. I hope they made it in, into a into a movie. You know, just me too. I told a bunch of friends, and and we did get a few to come periodically because it was only about about like six week run, and yeah. uh, right. again we went four times, right. including the final night, and just meeting the playwright and giving him the, no, that's, <laughs> the that's review. Great. And he's, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's great. Yeah. What was the playwright's name again? Tim Blake Nelson. 
Tim Blake. The only thing, Tim only, Blake. only, only, yeah, Tim Blake Nelson. The only quibble I would have is is to point out Socrates was very religious, you know, and probably he speaks of God in the singular. Probably, like you said, he was groping towards monotheism. May well have been otherworldly in his metaphysics. Uh, so whether he agreed with the forms or not, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't think anybody. Yeah. Does. But he was, he was, he was certainly, he was certainly re- religious. Uh, but that's not what we celebrate him for. We celebrate him for the birth of that's right. of, of a rational yeah. approach. A lot, a lot of people historically yeah. been religious, uh, but we, you know, uh, what distinguishes Socrates is the rational approach to uh, moral questions, the rig, the search for uh, the search for rigorous definitions, and the heroic stance. You know, to speak truth to power. Uh, Al Gore likes to use that yeah. phrase. He, he, it would be good if he actually ever does it, if he ever speaks truth to anybody. But that's a whole nother story mm-hmm. for, for another day. Mm-hmm. Socrates spoke yeah. to power and, uh, and did so, standing up for moral rectitude, you know, even at the cost of his, of his life. And as a, there's a, it's a few points, I guess we're, we're coming down to the, to the end here, a few last points mm-hmm. to wrap up. Socrates, Socrates saw himself as a gadfly talks about this and at the same yeah. time as being yeah. god's agent on earth gadfly you'll you know, kind of stick it pricking the the power of the state and the the high and the and the yeah. mighty with moral questions uh mm-hmm. you know it's not so important here here jesus centuries later in a certain context is is, is certain reminiscent of what socrates says it's not that a lot of similarities there yeah yeah not that important mm-hmm. to have you know, fancy clothes and to be wealthy, to be popular, to be admired, you know, to, to have social approval. What's important mm-hmm. is rectitude, moral uprightness, moral character. That's what's important. Uh, and so he's, he, he's a gadfly here, you know, annoying people who, who place these other things ab- above and before virtue. Uh, and, and he sees himself as doing, you know, as being God's emissary. He is doing God's work on earth. We see the religiosity here, but we could abstract away from yes. that because the, the important takeaway here is he's he's he recognized he preeminently recognized that virtue above all characteristics is what's valuable um, in, in human yeah. life. And by the way, I always put out to my students, and I think this is really important. Uh, the, the school I won't mention the names here. The school is secular. But it was founded by a Catholic clergy and still has a very close relationship with most of the families who send their kids to this college are Catholic. And the kids are generally practicing Catholics. They tend to be religious. They're good kids. I disagree about mm-hmm. religion. Overwhelmingly, mm-hmm. they're good kids. And I always say in class, and, and in, in any, any class that I teach, yeah. look, if you hold a religious approach to ethics, that's your business. It's not mine. It's not my job to try and talk you out of your religious-based ethics, my job is to teach philosophy. Mm-hmm. But what I will point out here is the idea that, uh, that some people have, that ethics is necessarily grounded in religion and that there's no ethics without religion is just flat out false. That belief shows an egregious ignorance of 2,500 years of Western philosophy mm-hmm. because there are any number mm-hmm. of philosophers who develop ethical systems who are very secular. Aristotle preeminently, but he's, he's not the only one. A moral philosophy yeah. is born in Greece, not in Judea. It's born in Greece with Socrates as a rational yes. approach to these subjects, as, as distinct from a faith-based approach. So I always stress that if you want to hold uh, yeah. you know, religious approach to ethics, this is America. First Amendment guarantees religious freedom. You're free to do so. But it's mistaken. It's mm-hmm. just an error to think that there's no ethics without religion. The whole history of, of Western philosophy shows that, Aristotle especially. And it's important for them mm-hmm. to know ethics is born as a rational discipline, is born uh, with the Greeks, not with the Jews or the Christians, but with the Greeks, and especially with Socrates. And this is why we're honoring the, uh, uh, the great man today. Uh, great point, Andy. And I just want to follow up on that because the two most famous deaths in Western civilization history are Socrates and Jesus. And a lot of people have drawn parallels between the two. Yeah, sure. But here essential difference. Socrates was an egoist in the sense that he's standing on his principles and there there was a high Greek culture was certainly more egoistic, whereas Jesus was the ideal who was sacrificed for the sins of others. And that is not, um, Socrates would never have accepted that. He never would have accepted that ideal 
Uh, so in that sense, um, his, you know, his moral certainty there was much more egoistic. And uh, that's, I think that's one other reason where the, you know, the, the two disciplines, what we'll just call Greek philosophy versus uh, uh, Judeo-Christianity, where they split off into yeah. uh, the impact, two famous deaths uh, throughout no, history. That's a good, that's so a good point. We could, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point, Robert. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the two fundamental life and death differences between the Greeks on the one hand and the Jews and Christians on the other, reason versus faith is, is one. Yes. Where the Greeks, the, the Greeks and Socrates, even though he's such a religious man, uh, held held re held reason as the primary means of gaining knowledge, whereas the Jews yeah. and the Christians, of course, and later the Muslims, uh, is is faith in a in a higher world. You know, you, there's a, there's revealed mm -hmm. text, Bible, the Quran, written by men who are divinely inspired. You just have to take it uncritically, even if it tells you you know impossible things like burning bushes speak and men live inside whales and yeah. virgins give birth and all this stuff. You just accept it critically where Socrates and the Greeks mm -hmm. said, I can accept those beliefs. What does that mean? The unexamined life is not worth meaning. What does it mean to say a man lived yeah. inside a whale for seven days? You know, he's going to, he's going to critique it. Reason over faith, great, uh, most important uh, uh, reason that Greek culture is superior to Judeo Christian. And the second one, the one you mentioned, egoism versus self-sacrifice, all of the Greeks, even the most religious ones, like yeah. Socrates and Plato, you know, the, they they yep. they they were egoistic in 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 a, in in a certain way, you know, and that that Socrates mm -hmm. certainly believes that the quest for moral rectitude, even if it means you might have to give up uh, wealth or you know you know a, a, a fancy home or popularity, the quest for moral rectitude is much more important for you to live well mm -hmm. in this world is much more valuable to you to be upright than it is to morally upright than it is to be wealthy or, or admired. And that's a, that's a powerful, yeah. that's a powerful point. But egoism over yeah, self-sacrifice, you're absolutely right. Andy, just going yeah. to our analysis of the Fountainhead, let's, that you're leading, we talk about just in part one, commercial success versus like moral character, where we see yeah, the Peter right. Keatings and the Guy Francones commercially successful, but the Henry Camerons and Howard Rourke's have the have the moral character that they're not tempted by these shortcuts. And so we have your fountainhead. We have your lead essay in the uh, new objective standard um, issue. A lot of stuff OSI is doing, other courses, other podcasts, uh, Toscon coming up. So uh, we just want to come to our site, see what we're doing. There's a lot of stuff, uh, particularly what uh, Andy's doing with um, uh, with all these heroes. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I just want to say, uh, yeah, the o OSI is doing great stuff. And I love, I want to thank you, know, you and Craig and everybody and Sarah and John, everybody at OSI John. for the, the mm -hmm. opportunity to do the Fountainhead, the course, which is which is such a great novel. It's so much fun. The every everything's available. You know, uh, everything's archived, right? So if people signed up now. Yes. Uh, they could. Yeah. They could still. See, or if they sign up five years from now, they could still see everything. You know, yeah. that that's archived. Yeah. I strongly recommend. And spoiler it. alert: There's a reference to Socrates right towards the end of the Fountainhead. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. Spoiler alert is uh, is right, but also what <laughs> one last point I want to sign off on about moral rectitude sure. as the most important thing <clears throat> in that in the early in the Fountainhead when Cameron says to Rourke, "You want to end up like me? You know, you know commercial <laughs> failure, and everything." And Rourke doesn't even realize he stands up. He says, "If at the end of my life, you know, I could you know be like like you are right now, I would consider it an honor I didn't deserve." And Cameron bellows, "Sit down." You know, you know, uh, but yeah, you can see the testimony here, uh, moral yeah. character above all. Now, Ayn Rand preeminently is the one who pointed out that the moral is the practical. And so that moral right. character will lead to practical success. And that if you're yeah. immoral, you know, like mm -hmm. Keating, it's going to lead you to practical failure. And the Fountainhead brilliantly dramatizes that. Your know, Rourke yeah. is successful because he's morally upright and Keating is unsuccessful mm -hmm. in the end because mm -hmm. he's morally delinquent. And that parallel yeah. all you know, through the book, you know, stresses that. And it's a good, 
in that yeah. regard, uh, you know, Ayn Rand is a brilliantly original philosopher and, uh, in my judgment, the greatest novelist in world literature. But that's a good testament to Socrates. Your moral character. Yeah, and, and if we go, if we just stay in the fountain, Socrates is a first-hander. You know, I mean, that's that's what we call him, the first to, yeah, to sure ask is. these moral questions. What is friendship? You know, courage. And uh, knowing that sure reason is. was the basis, and he answered to the question, how do you know? And the integrity that he lived, the way he died, as I said from the beginning, impacted the two most influential philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. And right. for those, it's right. a life right. well lived, and exa well examined Absolutely. too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And in Rock's courtroom speech, he glorifies the first handers, the innovators in, in every yeah. field who are punished, often you know, unrecognized mm -hmm. and or punished by their society. Well, Socrates is one of those innovative thinkers in, in, in the most foundational field of all, in the field of moral philosophy. And so, yeah, uh, yeah he stood up. Uh, independently on his, you know, on his own judgment and on, on, you know, in, in support of uh, right and wrong, uh, you know, as, as, as he construed in support of moral rectitude as the as virtue as the most important quality in human life. And he paid a price for it, mm -hmm. as Rob talks about in his yeah. courtroom speech, innovators often do. Uh, and Socrates certainly we benefited. one of them. And I think, yeah, we sure have. And I yes. think we can, <laughs> we can salute the great man. Thank you, Socrates, for your achievements. Yes. And we, you know, we we could point out uh, the the inspirational quality here of leading a heroic yeah. life, uh, and I That's hope right. every, you, me, you, everybody out there in Hero Land, let's have a heroic day and strive like Socrates to lead a more heroic life. And we'll be back, yes. everybody, next week on the Hero Show. Take care, everyone. See you then.